After yet another election, Spain is finally to have a government. That's after the socialists teamed up with a far-left party, but in a fragmented political landscape, can it solve the country's many challenges? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Just a few months ago, Spain's acting Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez refused to form a government with the Podemos party. Sánchez said he would have trouble sleeping at night if there were Podemos ministers in his government. But he's now performed a political U-turn and agreed to partner the hard-left party to form the country's first coalition cabinet in modern times. The breakthrough comes after Sanchez emerged as the weakened winner of Sunday's general election. Spain's ruling Socialist Party once again fell short of a majority, while the far-right Vox Party became the third most powerful political force. The preliminary coalition deal could put an end to the political deadlock that followed April's inconclusive election, but the two parties will still need the support of smaller parties in Parliament. Let's hear what Sanchez had to say. This is an agreement for four years. It is a term agreement. The new government will be based on cohesion, loyalty, government solidarity and the will to put forward the most ideal candidates to carry out the different responsibilities in the government. Of course, this agreement is created with the goal to be open to other political parties that make a stable majority in Parliament viable. The leader of the Podemos party, Pablo Iglesias, said the agreement has become a historical necessity. We have reached a pre-agreement that you already know of to form a progressive coalition government in Spain, a progressive coalition government that combines the experience of the PSOE with the courage of Podemos, a government that works for dialogue to confront the territorial crisis and for social justice as the best vaccine against the extreme right. Well, Unidas Podemos is a far-left political party founded in 2014 by the political scientist Pablo Iglesias. It emerged in the aftermath of Spain's financial crisis of 2008 and the M15 protests against what it called inequality and corruption. Iglesias says he's against austerity measures and supports policies that focus on investing in public services and protecting social rights. His party calls for financial reform that would include raising taxes on corporations and wealthy people and increasing the minimum wage. All right, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Madrid, we're joined by Miguel Ancho Marado, who is a political commentator and contributor to The New York Times and The Guardian. From Barcelona, Enrique Usale Ducao, who is a senior professor emeritus at Pompeo Fabra University. He's an author and specialist on Catalan separatism and nationalism. And from Newcastle, we're joined by Carlos Conde Solares, a senior lecturer at Northumbria University. Carlos is also an author and specialist on Spanish and Latin American history. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Miguel, let's start with you. Uh, start with you, rather. Is this coalition agreement a done deal or just an agreement in principle at the moment? Of, at the moment is an agreement in principle, though it signals very clearly that there will be an agreement um, in the making and that uh, this time it will be much easier to form a leftist coalition, if only because the two main parties involved, the Socialists and the far-left party Podemos, have no other have no other solution. They had very bad results in the, in the election last Sunday and this is the only way forward for them. Of course, they still have to convince at least one of the Catalan nationalist parties to support them, even if it is passively through an abstention. But I think that is going to be perhaps not easy, but it's going to be feasible. Enrique, uh, how will these two parties govern when they don't have a majority, even when you, you combine the two together? Uh, with difficulty. They'll, they can get, you have after a series of parties, a very fragmented uh, situation in Parliament. Uh, there's no desire for a grand coalition German style. They want the scene is of a uh, Italian style coalition, which is new in Spain. And uh, my suspicion is that if they put uh, forward the budget, 
which is the major pending short-term question. Spain has been on a repeat budget for three years. It might be possible for them to garner passive support from the right and the left opposition and okay. from the nationalists. All right. If, if, they, if they get the budget through, Enrique, um, they could see a way forward. But once they're, they're into the day-to-day -day business of governing the country, who will they be relying on for support in Parliament? Uh, they, need, they need something that's extremely difficult. The, the, the support they would presumably have are single deputy parties. There are two options. The Citizens Party, which just had a total shambles in the elections, and uh, the Republican Left Party, which is an independentist party, which could or could not have an approximation. But what I see is if the if the budgetary question is put forth, the Catalan government needs the money desperately, as do conservative and uh, socialist gov regional governments throughout Spain. Carlos, uh, so this could be pulled off. Carlos, I, I, I see you... More than that, very unlikely. Carlos, I see you nodding in agreement there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be a very, very difficult way forward for uh, Pedro Sánchez, the incumbent... Uh, Socialist Party Prime Minister with their um, anti-capitalist uh, uh, partners. Um, I don't really see how they are going to be able to um, nurture this very precarious balance that they would need in order to just gain a majority of one. Um, they are going to need the participation of at least another five parties. Uh, one of those small parties, by the way, is uh, Teruel Existe, you know, uh, talking about the parts of Spain that are becoming, uh, that are becoming empty, you know, parts of central Spain in particular, and their interests are actually the opposite of the interests of, uh, for instance, the Catalan Republican left. It's going to be very difficult to assemble a working majority because a lot of those interests are incompatible. I also see uh, some difficulty within the Socialist Party itself. I don't see how the current economy minister, um, Nadia Calviño, is going to be able to coexist with a potential vice president like Pablo Iglesias, an anti-capitalist. Uh, to put this into context, Nadia Calviño was part of the Troika of the... Um, uh, well, of, uh, of the European Union uh, entity that sort of imposed austerity on southern countries. And how is that going to coexist within the same government? I don't think it's going to be possible. Pedro, um, uh, yeah, Carlos, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you talked about Pedro Sanchez, the, the incumbent there. If this, uh, if this coalition gets through the investiture vote in Parliament, it, is Pedro Sanchez um, guaranteed the premiership? Could, could we be looking at another leader? I think that what Pedro Sánchez and Pablo Iglesias are trying to avoid with this very fast agreement is precisely the internal challenges that they might be facing otherwise. As Enrique mentioned earlier, their uh, election results have been pretty bad. What they were expecting was a stronger majority for the Social Democrats. They didn't get that. In fact, they lost um, three of their MPs. and. Um, really, the repetition of the election has well and truly backfired on uh, Pedro Sánchez that, let's remember, he was already sacked once from his position by the Socialist Party itself. The potential coalition with Podemos and the potential partnership with uh, the Republican left of Catalonia and with other nationalist parties is quite unpopular amongst the socialists, for instance, in Andalucía or in Castilla-La Mancha. That is, this partnership is, in my view, kicking the can forward in order to make sure that those questions aren't asked of either Pedro Sánchez or Pablo Iglesias. Enrique, if, if this government is, is beset by infighting, it, it's just not effective in, in the long run, is, is there a danger that it could collapse? And what happens if it does? It certainly could collapse. Uh, the amount of forces that have to be brought together and very disparate and uh, not at all comfortable forces, as Carlos has just said, uh, make it uh, have a very, in the best of cases, a very short-term future. What, what gives it life, what gives it air, is the fact that nobody wants third elections 
in the foreseeable future, at least uh, uh, as long as 2019 and early 2020 go. So that is the only backing it really has. As Carlos said, the election results were particularly chastising to the socialists and to uh, Podemos. They both, socialists gambled on gaining a good deal, they lost. They did not gain, they lost three uh, deputies. And Podemos survived more than some expected, but it did not really go forward. And so, and you have, as a, uni as a second unifying element, a very strong right-wing party surge, which is Vox, which is a, uh, uh, which has jumped to being a European-style anti-immigration, quote-unquote, populist party. Miguel, we'll, we'll come to, to Vox in just a moment. First, let, let's just uh, finish our discussion around the, uh, the, 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 this coalition that's being formed here. Um, how many cabinet seats within the government do you see Podemos uh, taking? What ministries is it likely to take charge of? Well, this is the key question. We don't really know yet because uh, this pre-agreement is pretty vague. The only thing we know for sure is that uh, Pablo Iglesias, the leader of Podemos, will be a vice president. This is, I think, telling of the, the sort of uh, politics you see inside Podemos. Podemos has become a party with a very, very powerful leader, a charismatic leader. Um, internal democracy has really gone out of the window. So this is the most important thing, that he will be the, the vice president. Um, but the, well, the vice prime minister, prime minister in, the, in the English parlance, um, it's crucial how many seats they will have, because it, it could go two different ways. It could be option A, uh, only four or five uh, ministries are given to Podemos. That, I think, would be what uh, Pedro Sánchez, the socialist leader, is aiming at. Uh, because that would give him an edge. Um, Podemos will suffer the, the destiny of um, so many junior partners in coalitions. They will be swallowed at the next election by the socialists. And uh, the option B would be that Podemos is more forceful in the negotiation, gets the upper hand and then gets uh, more ministries than some important ministries, say, for example, something to do with... Uh, with uh, labor ministry or, for example, even taxes or some sort of thing uh, of, of that sort, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's problematic because um, there's going to be um, lots of clashes within the cabinet, as has been indicated, the, the economics uh, minister, uh, Nadia Calvino, is very much an orthodox product of Brussels. Um, but also um, there, there's the danger that it will be the socialists who would be swallowed by, by Podemos at the next election. So this is crucial, but we don't really know yet how this is going to pan out. Oh, OK. Uh, right at the beginning of our discussion, Miguel, you, you talked about priority, priority number one for, for this government being the budget. Uh, and on the, the, the other main issues that, that face the country once they get down to the business of governing, Catalonia and the economy, do, do the two parties see eye to eye? No, not at all. Um, the, the socialists have been, uh, I would say, strategically ambiguous. The reality is that a large majority of the voters, I would say almost the totality of the voters of the socialists outside Catalonia and many in Catalonia oppose uh, Catalan independence. Um, in certain areas of Spain in particular, they are, they are very, sometimes even xenophobic towards the Catalans, it has to be admitted. But apart from that, uh, many simply resent uh, the movement towards independence in Catalonia. That for the socialist voters. The leaders, and especially Pedro Sánchez, has been playing a balancing act, trying to balance out his uh, approaches to the Catalan uh, nationalists and, and, on the other hand, uh, trying to sound tough to his constituency. For example, just a few days before the, the election, he was saying that he would uh, ban uh, by law uh, all referendums of independence. Of course, he, he, now, he now needs the support of uh, the Catalan nationalists. He will have to swallow his words. So um, that is the socialist. As for Podemos, they are in favor of self-determination. They want a referendum of independence. They have very close connections, okay. uh, connection with the, with the Catalan pro-independence parties. So, so it's totally different. Uh, Enrique, to what extent will its handling of, of the, the Catalonia issue define this government, do you think? 
it's uh, very likely that it will have a major role in defining the government. And the Catalan issue is, at this point, very, very hard to handle. Uh, you can't, as uh, Miguel said, there are strong opposition to concessions to Catalan independence, pro-independence opinion in much of Spain. And uh, the independence sector, pro-independence sector in Catalonia is absolutely adamant, uh, almost fanatically so. So it's very, very hard to pull anything out of hat, to come out with a, something that can cover over, even just paper over, uh, these two such opposing tendencies. Carlos, um, feel free to, to, to comment on the, on the Catalonia issue as well, but, but I, I do want to move the discussion now on to, to Vox and, and the rise of the far right. Is, is Spain shifting to the right politically? Right. Uh, the case of Vox is, I think, very different from what we've seen in, uh, in Italy with the Lega or what we've seen in uh, France with uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, Vox only really took flight, only really emerged after precisely 2017, after the um, illegal pro-independence referendum called by Carles Puigdemont in uh, Catalonia. So both things are, uh, are linked. That is, the more um, it is perceived across Spain that the Catalan independentists are getting uh, the upper hand or are getting concessions from the uh, government in Madrid, the more that box is going to rise. That is, whatever, uh, whichever way the new government, whatever government that is, handles the Catalan situation will have an effect on uh, the evolution of, uh, of box as a political force in Spain. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the Catalan situation, it is indeed very entrenched uh, at the moment, but I think that perhaps for the benefit of an international audience, it's worth saying that about 60% of the voters in Catalonia voted for uh, unionist parties, that is, voted for non-independentist parties. Uh, this is something that sometimes is a little bit distorted uh, abroad. That is, the Catalan people don't speak with just one voice. Quite often, they talk about the Catalan people as if they were un sol poble, as they say in Catalan, you know, one voice. And, uh, you know, that's a very totalitarian notion that some of the Catalan independentists uh, have. The reality is that, once again, the majority of Catalan voters have not chosen a pro-independence party. So this is also a bit of a nuance that I think has to be put across. Uh, Miguel, will the success of Vox allow it to set the agenda on the, the right of, of politics, uh, to, towards the right of political debate, at the expense of, uh, of the PP. What does this election mean for Spain's main centre-right party? Well, for the PP, is a disaster. These are the Conservatives. Um, basically because uh, the Vox is, is growing at their expense, but not only at the expense, there's a very interesting fact about Vox, and is that it's gotten lots of votes also from this now almost defunct centrist citizens' party, which votes that have gone directly from an avowedly liberal uh, party to the far right, uh, which is quite telling. And it means that, uh, among other things, that it is, as Carlos rightly said, the issue of Catalonia is the one that actually propels uh, Vox. Yes, they also have a, a discourse on immigration, control of immigration, but it's not really very important. They don't insist too much on that because, according to all opinion polls and the uh, st study of opinion in Spain, this is not a very important issue for most Spaniards, except for, perhaps for a, for a few areas. So, uh, yes, Vox will have an effect. It's having already an effect in the right wing, uh, in, the, in the Conservatives. Um, they, they, I don't think they have an idea how they can recover, retrieve these, these votes they've lost to the far right. And as, as long as they can't do that, they know they will, know they will not be in power for a long, long time. Uh, Enrique, Spain's right-wing parties have long accused uh, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez of, of being beholden to, to Catalan separatist parties, but he, he's going to need them to govern effectively, isn't he? How is that going to play with the far right? It will play badly. It's very difficult for him to attract uh, Catalan independentist support. Uh, and uh, he... I really, I go back to what I said before. I, I see it very difficult for the government to do much more than perhaps pass a budget. 
because a great many different forces from the PP to uh, part of Catalan independentist sentiment are, would accept that with some gilding of the lily. The gilding of the lily gets to be the difficult part because uh, Spain is a very uh, symbol-oriented uh, political culture and it's very hard to pull things off when they go against the particular ideological grain of a given sector. Gentlemen, we have... So um, I, I don't foresee a long government. We, we have um, just a few minutes left of the programme, gentlemen. I just want to get your, your, your final thoughts here on, on what this election tells us about the change in politics, not just in Spain, but right across, across Europe, with the rise of, of smaller parties, often from the right, fragmenting support for the larger traditional parties. Carlos, what's going on here? Well, the story is one of polarization, clearly, and um, in Spain as well as in, as in any other country, as you, as you rightly mentioned. I would go even farther when it comes to analyzing the box vote than Enrique mentioned before, uh, sorry, Miguel mentioned before. Uh, not only are they getting a large uh, chunk of the support of the center-right of the PP and of the Liberal Party, indeed, of citizens, but um, they are also getting a lot of support from um, the traditional working classes across Spain. When you look at the map, at the heat map of Vox across Spain, there are places like uh, Elegido, like Cartagena, like Murcia, uh, like the what used to be called the Red Belt of Madrid as well, where Vox are getting a lot of support. That is, it is a message that appeals. Uh, in the UK, you would call them the left behind. In other, you know, in, in America, we, we see what Hillary Clinton called from voters and all the rest. No? Um, it is a message that's appealing to people that are increasingly tired of uh, the politics of the establishment. And let's not forget that in the case of Spain, the establishment is very much not just the Socialist Party and the PP, but also the Catalan nationalists and the Basque nationalists that have played a really important role in the development of uh, Spain's territorial system. That is, the most privileged or the wealthier regions in Spain, like the Basque Country and Catalonia, have been running the show for quite a long time. And what's happening with Vox is that a lot of people in poorer regions of Spain are having enough of it. So there is a difference when it comes to the emergence of Vox in Spain and those of, uh, of the Front National or of the Brexit Party in the UK, but there is that particularity okay. that Spain right. has a territorial problem that other places perhaps don't have. OK, Miguel, would you agree with that? Yes, I, I agree. I will give you just a, a few numbers. Now we have 17 parties in Parliament, which is astounding. But of those 17 parties, 11 are actually either regional or local or uh, pro-independence or nationalist. And then of the other six parties, the six parties we could call national, three could be considered as radical parties, either left or right. This, this gives you an idea of how not just fragmented, but actually polarised Spanish politics has become. OK. There, gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to end the discussion. I'm sorry, Enrique, we, we didn't get some final thoughts from you. We're out of time. Uh, Miguel Ancho Marado, uh, Enrique Usadale, uh, Usale de Cao and uh, Carlos Conda Solares. Many thanks to uh, all of you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget, you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. I handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.